Welcome to the Registered Investment Advisor Podcast, where financial services marketing expert Seth Green interviews experts, executives, and top producers to share can't-miss tips on how they successfully manage their financial service firms, grow their businesses, create great relationships, and influence the industry. And now, here's your host, Seth Green. Welcome to the RAA Podcast. This is your host, Seth Green. Today, I've got the good fortune to be joined by Frank Fantosi from Plan Financial Services. Frank, thanks so much for joining us. Good morning, Seth. Thank you for having me on your program today. Our pleasure. Let's go back in time a little bit because you have kind of an interesting career path. How did you, you got started as an accountant, right? Yes, uh, I was in the beat you to fit, paint you to match industry. So um, I graduated with a master's in taxation and started out at Arthur Anderson in 1987. And uh, it was a great learning experience. But uh, as I found out in uh, with most public accounting firms, they they like to stay within the in the black lines. Thinking outside the box was always uh, while they encourage uh, original thinking from a process standpoint, it was difficult, for, at least for me to fit in. But I gave it a try for uh Geez, I think I got out of the industry about uh, 93, 94 when I started my own firm, uh, Plan Financial Services. What inspired you to start? You didn't start an accounting firm. What inspired you to start Plan Financial? Well, I, I really loved uh, the tax aspect of, of, of planning in public accounting, uh, but I found it was very, a little bit myopic because I thought in helping clients, there was more to it than just uh, keeping Uncle Sam out of your back pocket. So friends of mine said, hey, you're really good with people. Uh, why don't you look at financial services? And financial planning back in 94 was just starting to take root. I mean, financial planning existed for the ultra high net worth, family offices and things like that, but it never really became, it didn't really start becoming mainstream until uh, the, the early 90s. And uh, so that's how I pursued it and, and started out. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. My wife was pregnant. I left a good paying job and she goes, wow, you think it's a good time to start your own practice? I says, well, it's only going to get harder, so I figured I might as well do it now and pull the Band-Aid off. Well, I, I feel your pain. I also started um, my independent firm the same year that uh, my wife had quit her job to be a stay-at-home mom to our first baby. Wow, so a similar pro approach. <laughs> Which also happened to be uh, the year, the 07, 08, the year the subprime bubble burst. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> yes, and not so much. Uh, <laughs> So talk to us about Plan Financial, because you've got, um, tell us a little bit about how you designed it kind of to be different than the traditional, just regular plain old investment advisory firm. Right. Well, it was interesting. I, I knew when I started, I never wanted to be a solo practitioner, uh, that I really wanted to create a firm concept or what I call an ensemble practice. I, I really felt that, um, you know, to meet the, the complex needs that you have out there, when you talk about insurance planning, investment planning, estate planning, taxes, just general financial planning. While I feel I'm, I'm very capable and very smart, I, I can't be a specialist in all those areas. And bringing different points of view was always in my, you know, was my goal to really create a firm. But like most people, you start your shingle out. It was by myself. My wife was pregnant. We were going around stuffing um, mailboxes. So I'm really dating myself. This is really before internet marketing. Uh, I was starting putting flyers in people's mailboxes to use my tax services to get them in to talk about you know, what I call holistic or complete, you know, wealth management. But that was the goal from the beginning. And now we're up to uh, 13 uh, full-time individuals, six advisors. Um, really, the clients are owned by the firm. It, we, we've kind of moved away from that mindset that each advisor has a book of business. Uh, in fact, we just went through and reassigned clients within the firm because based on complexity and pers personality and needs of the client, we assign advisors based on what we think is going to be best for the for the client. So our firm really offers soup to nuts. We we have the ability and we do family office work for some of our, what I call our ultra net, high, uh, um, ultra net, net worth clients. But for, our, for most of our clients, we're, we're integrating tax planning, uh, financial management and investment planning, protection planning. And basically the, whatever the issues come up in our regular you know meetings or integrated meetings that we have with them, these are things that we touch on with, with our clients to just keep them on path. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You've obviously come a long way since the days of stuffing flyers and envelopes in mailboxes. How are you attracting clients now? Uh, well, I, th I think you'll find this uh, pretty common with most successful firms. If you're doing things right, our strongest way of acquiring practices organically through uh, client referrals. If you really do a great job, 
clients really want to help their friends by introducing their friends to their advisors because you know as you get older and you mature people tend to talk about two things they talk about their aches and pains or their health or they talk about their their finances with friends and then eventually someone's going to say hey you know i'm not as happy with my advisor they're not calling as much i'm not confident in their advice and they say hey um, you know we have a great team that's taking care of us i can introduce you to them so Clearly, uh, referrals are number one. And if I had to tell you our number two, it's our centers of influence. I would say accountants and um, in that order, accountants and then uh, lawyers. Um, not so much on the banking side anymore. It used to be that early on, but most banks really compete with us. Uh, there's not a lot of standalone banks that uh, that don't really offer financial services in, in their in their pocketbook. Do you run into issue? How do you nurture the accountants? Because you are technically you are one. Do the, you ever run into any pushback of why should I send you my tax clients? Because you might take their, their fear that because you could do the tax work, you could take them away. Yeah, that's a very, very fair question. And that's something that we discuss clearly with the, if they don't bring it up. So if, if it's someone new that I get introduced to as a CPA, if they don't bring it up, I bring it up. You always want to get rid of the elephant in the room. And um while I am a CPA and I maintain my licenses and we have another CPA on, on practice and an enrolled agent, we really don't compete with CPAs because we don't do corporate work. That's really where they make their money. Uh, the most C successful CPA firms, your regional firms or your local firms really want the business owner and they'll do their 1040 because it's tied to the business, but they're not really looking to do standalone 1040 uh, work. And really our 1040 work is, it's some of it can be complex, but it's for most, uh, for most CPA firms, they really don't want to do 1040 work. So that's really where we limit um, our work is in the, in the 1040 area. Um, if we do have a client that owns a business, we really don't want to do their 1040. We feel it's best that the CPA who's preparing the corporate return is also handling the 1040. It's, it's more efficient. Uh, it's more effective in preparing things. But we do ask, you know, with all of our clients, we do ask for a copy of their 1040 because it really influences how we manage their investments as well as potentially how we would provide financial advice. So it's, it's part of one of our data intakes. So every, every year when we meet with our client, we already have standing orders with their CPA to forward their, forward their preparer's copy of their tax return to us. That makes a lot of sense. You've gotten quite a bit of media exposure over the years. You've been on CNBC, Fox Business yeah. News, Market Watch. You've been written about in Wall Street Journal, Dow Jones, New York Times. How have you been able to pull that off? I mean, most advisors would kill for that kind of press. <laughs> well, I was a fortunate. Candidly, we used the PR company uh, to, to help engage. Now, you have to be good at it. I felt I, I did a very good job in engaging on the screen and answering questions and taking complex issues and, and making it understandable or what I call street language. Because uh, one of the criti criticisms of our industry is that um, advisors tend to talk down to clients and not intentionally, but we use our, you know, industry jargon and, you know, and people don't get it. We take for granted how much we, we don't know. And we think most individuals really understand what we do and they don't. So what, what happened was, and the reason why I started pulling out of it was uh, most of the time they were really focused on market movement and I, what I call being a stock jock. And while I can talk well about markets and macroeconomics, I got uncomfortable because it really went against how we manage money and how we advise clients about how to handle their investments. They're always looking at what should clients be doing today? The market did this. What should clients be doing today? Well, if you have a great portfolio strategy and you have great underlying investments and you're meeting your goals, just because the market has consternation this week, or yeah, let's just talk about this year, the market's had a lot of consternation this year, doesn't mean you abandon your portfolio and the strategy and the investments that got you here. So I got frustrated with it because candidly, between you and I, I was really looking for more of a permanent gig where I would be talking about wealth management in, in holistic terms, where investments and market issues are part of that. How do you plan for kids' you know, education? How do you deal with estate matters? How do you deal with things when a, when a loved one passes away? These are things that you know, I'd like to talk about on a regular basis, uh, kind of like the Susie Orman approach. I mean, you know, whether you like her or not, I mean, she really developed a great niche for herself in providing, you know, advice in, in, in that regards. And she's really done a great job monetizing it. Yeah, absolutely. Lover or hater. Yeah, she has certainly built a name for herself. Let's talk about that. How have you built a name for yourself and for Plan Financial? How do you differentiate yourself from the other RIAs out there? Well, that's a good question. And we keep looking at how, to, how do we 
sharpen the tip of the sphere. Um, you know, it's a difficult process, I think, when you're in a service business where you're dealing with inter uh, intellectual capital. Uh, because for most consumers, it's hard for people to decide what is the difference between you and another advisor. Like, I know who our peer group competitors are in, in Northeast Ohio, but if you ask a consumer, it's really going to be a much bigger space. So, you know, again, how do you differentiate? And, and so I think for most advisors, they really need to look at their process. I think number one, people identify with a process. Oh, they, they know what they're doing because they have a formula, they have a recipe that they follow. So I think that's very important and something that we talk, we, you know, we talk about. I think another important differentiation is that we use a team approach. Again, I know I'm very knowledgeable, but most advisors, I think, out there really sell themselves. And when I'm out there, I'm selling the team. You know, and they say, well, wait a minute, Frank, you know, am I going to work with you? I go, you may work with me. You may work with someone on, on the team. And even if you work with me, there's going to be several other people on the team that are going to work with me in, in providing advice. And it's the only way we feel we can deliver the, the type of res results we, we want. And I think thirdly, I think if you look at our bandwidth of services, most advisors don't provide the full bandwidth of services we want so that we provide. And so when clients look at us, they say, well, wow, you're providing, you know, 40 different possible services to us, while the typical advisor we're talking to is maybe providing 60% of that. And so when you look at that in total, they feel that they're going to get a much bigger or better experience. But at the end of the day, it's a trust relationship. So the, early on, if you don't demonstrate right away that they made the right choice, that they're getting the touch rate they want, they're getting the understanding they need, they're going to start to question you know, the relationship. It's like dating, right? You know, you go out on the first date. If it doesn't go so well, you're going to start questioning, well, I, do I want to go on a second or third date? And I think in our industry, it's the same way. So every step early on until you really establish complete trust, then you're, you're always going to be basically auditioning for that client. Your passion is obvious. What do you like best about what you're doing? I love helping people. Uh, if you think, you know, I've been at it now and with my own company, we're entering our 28th year. So now I've, I've seen clients that I've worked with retire. I've seen them have children. I've seen them have grandchildren. And now we're starting to work, you know, multi-generational with these families. And the best thing I hear from our clients is they appreciate how we care for their family. They appreciated that we help them accomplish certain goals. So while we tend to focus on money and rate of return a lot, a lot we focus on what we call rate, um, return on life. It's at the end of the day, when you sit back, and you look at your life, you say, hey, what did I do between you know, my birth date and my, my end date? What did I accomplish? What were my experiences? And I think that's the greatest gift I have is when I see clients accomplish things through our help in managing their, their monies, and they tell us that, they give us that feedback, that's what's rewarding. And so that's what keeps me juiced every day and why I come into the office. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we know your time in the office is incredibly valuable. We greatly appreciate you spending some of it with us. This has been Seth Green with Frank Fantosi from planfinancial.com. Frank, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Seth. Have a wonderful holiday season. I appreciate you inviting me on as a guest today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks everybody for watching or listening. We'll talk to you or see you next time.